Please welcome to the stage Bank of America Chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan with Bloomberg's David Weston. So, Brian, thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here. They must have been expecting some other people or something. <laughs> There's plenty of room if you want to invite some guests. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, two or three weeks ago, we were talking about the debt ceiling. We don't have to talk about that anymore. But maybe we can talk about the aftermath right. of what we went through there in Washington. And specifically, one of the things that's been covered on Bloomberg and elsewhere is, obviously, the government coffers were drawn down pretty substantially as they came right up to that so-called X date. And now they've got to issue a lot of T bills. I saw one estimate like eight hundred fifty million by the end of the summer. A billion. It, we wish it were a million. A oh, billion, eight hundred fifty billion, and, and, and maybe a trillion by the end of the year is what is what I saw. Uh, the speculation is that might draw liquidity out of the marketplace. Are you seeing that at Bank of America yet? Yeah, it's too uh, strong because I think if you look, they've daily published their balances and they moved up a chunk. And uh, you guys covered this today, and because of tax payments coming in, and you get. Uh, Estimated tax payments, et cetera, but they, they, their policy has been by their own design to get to have a trillion dollars of money running through this that they have at all given times, so they fund to keep it level there. So they're going to have to push up and do that kind of funding level. You know, when I ask people, is this disruptive or not, all the experts tell me yes and no, and yes in the <laughs> hand, there's a lot of issuance, but no, everybody knew it was coming, and so it may move sort of trading markets around, but fundamentally, the idea that the government was going to you know, run out of money was not something people were planning on. So we'll see. It, it, it's just another thing to worry about for the next six months. Does, does it put any kind of a crimp in your ability to lend? Uh, I mean, that money has to come from somewhere. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of money sitting at the Fed and the overnight repo facility and money funds has just been put back. And it, so the dynamics of how this all moves around is interesting. I don't think, and in the, in the, in the worry be it took deposits out of the banking system, but, you know, there's, I, I, I'm not sure people see that as a big issue. And by the way, it, the Treasury Secretary, and I think they said today, they will do this on a non-disruptive basis because they don't. They just ran down to $39 billion. We're still able to pay the bills. So they, they don't need to get there tomorrow and they'll build it up over time. But their goal is to get back in a more regular way. The, the best news about this whole dialogue is the they've got an agreement that extends a period of time. So we shouldn't have to deal with this for a while, which is really critical because the United States has to be the beacon of stability, strength in the world. And at times when this discussion's going on and you travel the world, Everybody gets fixated on it because the United States is the benchmark of benchmarks. And if it goes completely somehow accidentally, it's a real problem. And so they would get all fixated and all this sort of activity into planning for it, what would happen to all our company. It, it just, it, it would just be better if it didn't go on. But it's a political process and they have. Well, speaking of stability, we, we didn't look much like that for a little while there, right? Do people forget about that after it's over or are there lingering effects, do you think? Well, I think that the. the Look, I, in my memory, in 2011, it felt more serious at the time than it did this time because I think people had learned from the actual shutdown and some of the dynamics in the actual downgrade of the United States that you can't get that close. So I think the, the assured, uh, assurances of you know, the, both political parties plus the experts involved always was we're not going to let this. It may be messy. It's like a great tragedy. You always know what the end's going to be, but it's fun to see how they get there. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, they got there, and that's the important thing. But it's a political process. There, there's another serious question about how much debt the, company can, the country can afford and all that stuff. None of that's embedded in this as much as it is, you know, the issue at the moment was really getting the, the, the idea that somehow they would not be able to pay their bills or have to shut down and or default off the table, and that's what's done. Perhaps a related I issue, actually, are the reserves required of your bank and other banks. Uh, there are reports, and I don't think it's unexpected to anybody, that there's going to be an increase in capital requirements. If that goes forward, will it have any effect on your ability to make loans? Yeah, that, so there, there are multiple discussions which get sort of pushed together. There's the standards for the final finalization of Basel, mm -hmm. which is this broad set of things. Uh, that's going on. This stress test is going on that we forget about, but that's going on also. And that resulted in some surprises in the industry in terms of capital demands last year. And then there's, uh, um, and then there's the question of uh, applying standards that apply to the GSIB banks, the biggest banks, in broader in the platform because of the size of some of the banks. And so all three of those things get mixed together a little bit. But, you know, in the end of the day, it, it's a fairly straightforward. If our capital ratios go up by 100 basis points, we basically, you know, simply put, uh, can't make about $150 billion of loans. And it, because people say, well, 
you have more capital, you can make more loans. But if we took risk on that capital, we wouldn't have that capital ratio. So it has to be a riskless build of capital. It can't be out there taking risk. So the only thing you can really do is leave it in cash or buy treasury securities. And, and that's not a very productive use of, of, of money. So, um, and if you had it, 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 and that's the problem. And so every time capital goes up, there's a, there's a countervailing effect to it. It impacts lending. Is that a gating function here right now? Over the last couple of weeks, you've been saying that, in fact, some of your lending is slowing down anyway, just because the economy is slowing down. Is it a demand? For, is there demand enough for the loans that you can't make? That, that ebbs and flows all the time. So the loans, the loan demand is more a product of customer activity. And so we, our team has a recession predicted uh, beginning uh, in the third quarter, fourth quarter, first quarter. Bank of America research team, which Candace Browning Platt leads, is tremendous, and they have that. Um, that has moved out a little bit as a consumer and activity stayed stronger, uh, even in light of the fastest uh, Fed rate increase in a long time. And so, but it's still the prediction. And so I think companies are having gone through, you know, the inflation and then it sort of flattening out and thinking about the future, just being more careful because they realize that, you know, some are able to move prices, some are able to do it. They're getting relief on the commodity side, on the price side, but are they going to be able to hold price demands? Is final demand in the construction industry going to be as strong a year from now as it is today? And the housing, it, all this is on people's minds, so they tend to uh, uh, pull in. And so that means line usage is flattened back out. So line usage was here before the pandemic and then fell and moved up, and it was kind of moving up, you know, incrementally back to where the pandemic sort of flattened out for the last couple of months, which means that you know, companies are just being a little more careful. So I, I see actually a survey was done in this room of the likelihood of recession in Q1 of 2024, and it looks like, uh, what is that, 65% of the people agree with your research. Isn't that good, good to know you've got, <laughs> you've got a ratification there? Yeah, it, one thing we always have to be careful, if I, somebody educated me once that the four projection of recession by economists is always like 15 or 20%, so <laughs> anything above that means that they're convinced. So, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. uh, so let's talk about something that's very much in the news these days, that's artificial intelligence, particularly yeah. generative yeah. artificial intelligence, large language model. Uh, you and I have talked in the past about Erica, yeah. uh, which is a form of, I think, machine learning you've been using for some years now, five years. We've never really talked about what that is. Yeah. So take us through what Erica is for Bank of America right now, and then we can talk about where it's going. So what Erica is is a product, a capability that's in the mobile banking app and other that you can go, go into and type, either type in or say, you know, pay my landscape or pay my school, you know, school tuition, whatever it is, you know, and it will then say pay and it'll say the name of the, per, of the provider how much you want to pay, and then it'll go pay it. It'll just run through the bill payment system. So instead of going to bill payment, going down the list and doing all stuff, it do it. Or what's the routing number? What's my routing number? Because that's a topic that people call us and ask us about five million times a year they used to call us. Now they don't have to. <laughs> the routing number is on the base of your check, and routing number for all yeah, of you is exactly. the same. So <laughs> it's, it's not a, but people call because, you know, frankly, judging by the age of the people laughing, we were taught somewhere how to write a check and how the numbers <laughs> worked and what was your account number. That's no longer in the system. So um, when somebody's doing ACH and stuff. So, so uh, really like seven or eight years ago, we said, let's build something that can do that kind of language processing, the LP part of the uh, uh, thing, and, and, and then predict what the question was, use our data and our information, and, and come back with the answer to them. And so we started to do that, and the first thing we realized is the language that was out there for these natural language recognition type things was not written for banking. So what's my balance? Do you want to go to a yoga class? You know, <laughs> it, 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 think about it. it had, so the first thing I had to do is we went to uh, uh, outside and got them to write a banking language pro, uh, program and, and things, and then we had to pair it with our data and our information. And so that's now five years old. And you know, 20 million people use it, and they use it 150, 200 million times. Took, we're just ready right, right to cross a billion interactions with it. We'll get another billion in another 12 to 18 months. It's growing that fast. Um, and it just saves a lot of time for the customer and client. And it's very, the experience is great. And yet people, I think, will start using it even more now because they're playing around with ChatGPT and doing other things that this was sort of foreign to them. They were, what is Erica, like you asked? But what we've seen is it just continues to grow. And, you know, 30, 20 percent interactions year over year, 30 percent, just people going because people like it, use it more and more and more, and it can answer a query. Now, what the flip side of this is why have we deployed it when you hear all the worries you have about right. it? This is our data, this is our processing, this is our predictive language, uh, artificial intelligence tool, the virtual assistant feeding off of our Q and A's and questions that we've edited to make sure they're right. So we don't have 
the problems that we're dealing with everybody's data and everybody's answers and everybody trying to figure out what is it perfectly going to apply. And so that controlled environment isn't the environment that these wonderful things are running on. At some point, they'll come together. In other words, why do we have our proprietary one when you can use it? But you've, in between then is the ability to make sure your data doesn't get pulled into places that shouldn't be, making sure it works appropriately on your systems. And you're reading the articles in the New York Times today and stuff, you know, about in the healthcare industry, there's something written up. And all this, you know, all these pluses and minuses, the legal case everybody's written about and all this stuff. It, it, you know, those are the risks. And even the people who really know this, you know, tell you, this is three to five years of work to get those Vagaries build a system, but we see it today. Now, you took that same stuff and you went and applied it to analyze who are the best customers to call based on our data by people making inquiries to it for prospects in our business banking, and it was called Banker Assist, and that is out there operating every day. So, if a person has you know 100 prospects are looking at that in that line of business, and they can't call 100 all at once. So, it tells them the best 10 based on who they cover, what they do, uh, the kinds of industries they cover, the activity in the industry. Look, and these are 50 million under revenue companies. So this is not huge companies and doing searches of the outside environment and talking about it. So it, it, we use it in other places already. It, it, it's got high potential. It just, we got to make sure we maintain the appropriate customer experience, the appropriate control element around it to make it work. We'll talk about the control specifically because one way to expand it is just get more usage of it, which you're doing right now. Uh, another way is to have it do more things. And we, we had a report actually on the Bloomberg this week about the CFPB, yep. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, coming out and warning banks, saying watch this generative AI banks because it can make some mistakes. Yep. How do you make sure that you can use it the right way and you don't go too far? Right. So that's the constraint on the openness of it, for lack of a better term, and by constraining it to you know, our data and our information and editing and looking at the answers it gives and constantly making sure but that's easier when you're saying it's our customer base, our data, our systems, our information, and our transactions. I'm not trying to assess the whole, <laughs> yeah, everything out there, and that's a whole different question. So, and that's, but that's the lesson learned. It, but that environment doesn't do a lot of good for society. It does a lot of good for Bank of America customers and Bank of America. The question to make it good for society, it's got to have all of it in there. And that's the bridge from here to there is that question. So, you know, the simple answer is we, we, we monitor that. We build it proprietarily, so it was built around our... Uh, this effectively the same thing a human would, did, would have done if asked the qu uh, question. And then, you know, we convert that and then we back test it. You have to always look at it. We don't, we underwrite with automated and artificial intelligence and automated tools, but not in an open environment like this where the customer can keep at it's, it's much more controlled as to how that works. One of the hallmarks of your administration as, as CEO of Bank of America has been controlling the costs. Yeah. You've been very adamant about that and very diligent about it throughout. What levers do you have at this point? Is AI a lever to help control costs, do you think? Yeah, it will be, and it will be another. I always think of these things in arcs, you know, so what could you do now that will pay back over time and keep paying back? And so um, if you started out big fundamental things we made, before people knew what the cloud was, we built an internal cloud. What that did is took all the server environments which were inefficiently disposed of, and that's the theory of a cloud, and pushed them together and said, you may want you know, green servers, but you're going to take the blue ones because your software operate on them because you had somebody deciding that green ones are better than blue ones. So we pushed that in, and that, that did it. Then you went to the cloud. And then, so these arcs of movement are just, so then you went to the cloud with parts of your stuff. And the question is, what can you do more? And each of that pays you back over and over again. And so, but the first answer was to go from 30 data centers to five or six and then down to two or three. And then, then you have to have a certain amount of, and that, that saved us, you know, four or $500 million of run rate expense a year, to give you a sense. I mean, those are big moves. Um, and, all, and, and then now the public cloud and et cetera. If you think about it, so you have to think about all the costs that way. So in real estate, we had 120 odd million square feet of real estate when the management team started in 2010. We're down to 60 to 65 or 70. And we still, with all the packing and stacking and it, work rules, even come the pandemic, got to about 80%. So there was a lot of room to go. And now with all the uh, work rules and stuff, you have a whole other round to go. And so all that is, you just manage expenses by looking at all work that can go away and all the efficiency go away and how you apply technology. And then you got to get the customers to use it. So 70-odd um, percent of people our age bracket and above uh, <laughs> use uh, digital today. Um, that number is growing, the fastest growing segment we have. It's not surprising that millennials and, and Gen Z and et cetera have a higher representation. But the reality is, is it's not getting everybody to use it. It's also getting everybody to use it fully. So 
even with younger people who use it a lot, still will deposit their checks at the branch. You know, that difference is $5.50 uh, and a nickel, depending on branch, uh, hand it to a teller, put it in an ATM, or do another thing. And, and so there's a migration. Even with people you think are using it, they still, we still have a quarter of a billion dollars will go out of the ATMs by tomorrow this time. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's amazing. So how do you get usage? So it's all those techniques just applied, applied. And will AI help that? Yes, because we have you know, 14,000 call agents. We have, where AI we think is near-term helpful is in computer uh, development, program development. And you know, that open source coding and analyzing, you still have to test it, but you can get it written faster, make it, make it simple for people. And that, we think, has great applications sooner rather than later. Well, when we talk about costs, what about headcount? I know you said that it's not so much you're laying off as you're just not hiring as many as you were a year ago. Well, this goes back to economic, and I even talked to customers. So last May, we hired 3,000 people, uh, 3,000 people, excuse me. This May, we hired, you know, six, 700. And that's all because the turnover rate fell because last year we were in the middle of great resignation and now it's completely different. So we, you know, we went from 12% turnover in a company, which is sort of the long-term level we're at pre-pandemic down to six, up to 15, and now back down, getting close to six. So we don't have to hire as many people, yet we keep managing the headcount down. We'll be, uh, we just had 20, 500 wonderful interns start this week, so that, that'll make us about, by the time we cross the quarter end, about 2.15, but you take them out, we'll be 2.13, 2.13 and a half, or something like that, down from 2.16, 2.17 at, at year end, and we've peaked about 219,000, not 219. More broadly, do you think the job market is a bit softer than what the Fed realizes, because a lot of their numbers are backward looking? Yeah, I think, I think if you talk to employers today in technology spaces, there's always specialized things like, uh, welders in certain businesses and high in manufacturing uh, help explosion in the Midwest just having been out there. But in general, it's much less tight than it was in the spot market. And that's why the current rates are going down and all that stuff. You just see it in the amount of hires. And, you know, so job postings are still high. I'm not sure CEOs across, that I talk to are pushing people to fill those as much as fill them when you have to. And that, that has a dampening effect on the labor market that won't show up in the aggregate numbers. It, employment's still at you know 3.7 percent unemployment. It's still very strong, and so the big debate when you if you want to drive your economists crazy, say how can you have an unemploymentless recession, yeah. and you know they can't quite get there, and that's kind of the interesting question. And so even the highest predictors of uh, unemployment don't even get to five percent, which is hard to square. One last one, another hallmark uh, uh, for you has been responsible growth yeah. for Bank of America. From, from the day you took over, that's what you said you were pursuing. And you've also been uh, fairly um, explicit about ESG investing and how that fits. There's been some political turmoil about that in the country now for, with some of the states now, including some affecting Bank of America. How do you put together your desire for responsible growth on the one hand with taking into account things like environmental and, and social and governance? Well, as we look out, we, we, the oldest part of the company has been around for 230 years now. They're almost in pushing beyond that. And so, you know, our industry is a product of this, the communities it operates in. So we make it pretty simple. We, we think of who we have to do a great job for. We have to do a great job for our customers. We have to do a great job for our teammates because we have to be the best place for teammates to work so we have the talent. We have to do a great job for our shareholders. We just had record operating profits in the first quarter. And we have to do a great job for our communities because frankly, a bank reflects the economy. And so if the communities aren't strong, we're not gonna be strong. So that's how we run the company and responsible growth really talks about that a little differently, but that's how we run the company. And, and that's, but we have, to, it's the genius of the end, profits and purpose, not one or the other. And you know, Jim Collins wrote about that in 1996 is the theory behind, you know, there's the thought process behind it. That's all good stuff. And the answer is sort of what's wrong with that? You know, thinking about how to how to do a great job for my customers, how to do a great job for my team, how do I do a great job for our shareholders, how do we do a great job for our communities? What, you know, and that's so. You know, when you think about the energy and stuff, you know, go out to North Dakota with Senator Kramer. We talked to the people. They got a net zero commitment at the state level and everything, and they got all this innovation to do carbon capture storage. Our job is to help lean into that and make that happen. Well, we have energy for everybody and good, cheap energy for everybody, and energy for people in the global south that don't have this. You know, these are interesting questions, but at the end of the day is private sector will drive this, and the money's there, and the talent's there, and we gotta drive it, because in the end of the day, we can make it happen and have good growth, and frankly, from the United States perspective, dominate the place. Brian, thank you so much. Always great to talk to you. Brian Moynihan, he's the chair and CEO of Bank of America.